the authorities could see that the power of print was potentially very great and was potentially uh, able to exploit any weaknesses and undermine government. Printing was a bit of a dangerous sport. They would want to make sure that it was not going to incite the populace. This video looks at a rather unexpected item to find among the collections of the Church of England. It's a bound volume of six literary works, all published at the end of the 16th century. It's actually a rather astonishing volume. Little pamphlets, mostly literary, all bound in the same parchment. This particular volume is unusual because it contains the signatures of the booksellers who printed the works. Among them is Shakespeare's history play, Henry IV, Part II. The book belonged to Richard Bancroft, who became Archbishop of Canterbury and bequeathed his collection to found the library at Lambeth Palace when he died in 1610. Librarian Hugh Carhill and archivist and librarian Giles Mendelbrot discuss the mystery of why this item came to be included among Bancroft's collection and explore what it reveals of the fervid anxieties of church and state in the last years of Queen Elizabeth I. Each of these uh, little books individually is signed, or three of them anyway, are signed by the booksellers involved, who in each case different booksellers. They're then sent to Bancroft as Bishop of London to show that the booksellers have played their part, have published the book as, uh, as it was in the manuscript version that the, arch that the bishop and his chaplains would have seen. I mean, you can see uh, that, that the Andrew Wise, the John Flaskett and the Thomas Hayes are three different people, individuals, signing their names. Registration of booksellers' ownership of particular texts in this period depended on entry in the entry books of the Stationers' Company. And we know that several of these works were entered in the Stationers' Company register all pretty much at the same time. Uh, and in two out of those three cases, in fact, the Thomas Hayes and the John Flaskett, uh, there are signatures which one can compare with in the station's company records, which make it clear that those are their own personal signatures. So that suggests that uh, the presence of these volumes is somehow tied up with the process of entering books at Stations, stations Hall. Hall. The first part of that process was to get the book licensed and allowed by the authorities. And who in 1600 was the person whose uh, permission you had to get, it was Richard Bancroft, then Bishop of London. And is that why you think that, it, well, at least two of them are, are signed by the um, uh, publisher? It seems to be their hand, you said. Yes. So that's actual proof, you know, they've signed a copy and that copy is in so the library th of Bancroft. This is, the, this is a, it's, it's a sort of certification, really, that this is the book as it, as it was printed and sold on the streets. Uh, this is also the book as it was allowed by Bancroft, and this is uh, uh, part of the legal process which they're going through to make absolutely certain at this very sensitive time in English history uh, that, uh, the, that the book has been read and allowed by the authorities. People would be very wary of Bancroft there was a prison at Lambeth. He certainly had the power to lock people up and to get people into very serious trouble. So why might Bancroft and the authorities have regarded these particular texts as potentially dangerous? At the beginning it has some poetry, Edward Waterson's Thames Sadus, 1600. Uh, then it goes on to uh, some more verse, but more topical verse about uh, English campaigns in Ireland, England's hope against, against Irish, Irish hate. hate. Um, and of course that was also highly controversial and the Irish were winning in the battles. There was a um, series of battles in 1598 which the Irish had won and Essex went off to Ireland to try to um, uh, salvage English honour in this 
in this campaign, and that was also rather humiliating. Then it goes on to the uh, Italian's dead body, Stockwooding English flowers, flowers, which are memorial verses for Sir Horatio Pallavicino, who was quite possibly the wealthiest man in the city of London, uh, but whose death in 1600 was also slightly controversial because he'd been employed on diplomatic missions by Elizabeth I, and she then complained that in the treaties he'd signed, he'd given away too much money to uh, foreign powers. And so various attempts were made, I think, to uh, extract some of that money back, back from, from Pallavicino's estate after he died. So even these poems are potentially uh, a bit controversial. Then we have the second part of Henry IV continuing to his death and coronation of Henry V with the humours of Sir John Falstaff and swaggering pistol as it hath been sundry times publicly acted by the Right Honourable the Lord Chamberlain, his servants, written by William Shakespeare. It's the only copy, in fact, uh, as far as we know, uh, of any of Shakespeare's quarto plays, which is uh, directly linked to the bookseller who published it. And the reason I say that is that if you turn to the last blank leaf of the book, L2, uh, you'll find uh, the signature of Andrew Wise. And Andrew Wise is the person mentioned in the imprint, which reads, printed by V.S., Valentine Sims, the printer, for Andrew Wise and William Aspley, 1600. So astonishing, really, to have that link, very direct link to the bookseller uh, for this book. The script of Henry IV posed a particular danger, both to the booksellers who printed it and to the individuals in the church who authorised it. Recent events would have made them all too aware of the peril. It's a very interesting period, this period around 1600. It was a time when it was very apparent to everybody that the Queen wasn't going to last mm -hmm. that much longer. Uh, and it was also a time when there was a lot of speculation about the Queen's favour and who it was bestowed on, and the Earl of Essex, who had been the Queen's favourite, was suffering a very rapid decline in his fortunes at court, linked to the failure, really, of his campaigns in Ireland, linked also to his involvement in a contemporary scandal to do with another book that was being published about the same time, uh, also to do with the history of Henry IV. So in 1599, Sir John Haywood had published his history of Henry IV, and in it he put a dedicatory epistle to the Earl of Essex, supporting him against some of the criticism. This caused a kind of furore. It was an enormously successful book in book trade's terms. The publisher, John Wolfe, said that no book had ever sold better. At the same time, it was deeply offensive to many of the people at court who were opponents of Essex. The story of Henry IV is the story of a man who uh, can see how badly governed the country is and uh, by Richard II and who deposes the king mm -hmm. um, uh, and takes over. Uh, so Bolingbroke becomes Henry IV. So uh, to publish any kind of narrative of that sort at that moment uh, is potentially rather explosive. So for all those reasons, uh, Hayward's book in 1599 was called in, the dedication was removed, excised by order of the Archbishop, then Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, uh, and when a second edition was published in the summer of 1599, that was rapidly seized and burned at um, Bancroft's London Palace. Hayward was put in the tower for nearly three years huge sensitivity, almost panic among the authorities, and nothing shows that panic perhaps better than the declaration in the summer of 1599 the Archbishop of Canterbury and Richard Bancroft, Bishop of London, made that uh, no books um, on history uh, and no plays 
should be published without the express permission of either a member of the Privy Council or of themselves, and that even if this permission was said to be said to have been given, uh, there should be actual proof that that, that that permission was genuine. So you can see the worry. Um, uh, the Queen is coming to the end of her reign, coming to the end of her life. Um, the succession um, could be in question if there was rebellion. Um, and there had been scandal um, the previous year. Um, so you can see the sensitivities uh, around. Um. Absolutely. So these come out in the summer of 1600, within a few months on one side of all of the controversy about Hayward's book, and uh, a few months the other side of Essex's rebellion and execution. So it really is a time of um, terrific in infighting, intrigue, uh, and real concern about public opinion and possibilities of insurrection. And such concerns about the power of literary works to incite rebellion proved to be well founded. It was interesting that actually when the supporters of the Earl of Essex were gearing themselves up, psyching themselves up to rebel in February 1601, uh, what did they do beforehand? But they went to a play. So I think there is, in London in particular, there is a sense that control of the streets of London uh, is a volatile thing and it's a thing which can be affected by both uh, published and performed texts. As a fiasco of Hayward's earlier text of Henry IV demonstrated, printing books wasn't just a dangerous sport for the booksellers. Church officials also could find themselves in grave peril should they grant permission for a literary work and get it wrong. One of Bancroft's chaplains, Samuel Harsnett, who actually licensed Hayward's history of Henry IV, uh, was extremely fortunate that he got away, uh, but only by a great deal of special pleading. Uh, he even wrote that his wife was in bed expecting a child and had stopped eating and drinking uh, because of her fear of what was going to happen to him mm -hmm. as a result of his having licensed uh, Hayward's Henry IV. Uh, and of course that also reflected badly on Bancroft. This volume of Bancroft's is among the first books to form the collection at Lambeth Palace Library. So what can it tell us about the founder Richard Bancroft and his reasons for creating a library for the Church of England? So you can see why Bancroft may have collected these items together and bound them together. Yes, so I, I, th I think what, you, what you've got here is the booksellers submitting evidence of the fact that they have gone through the due process. process. And these are, in a sense, um, Bancroft's file copies in case something comes back to bite him. And we know that Bancroft uh, used his library in that way partly as a way of, um, as a kind of bank of evidence that might later be put, produced in court. That's also the reason why I think we have remarkable collections at Lambeth Palace Library of, of witchcraft pamphlets, another genre which you might not necessarily Ex expect to find. find. In the library of an archbishop. Exactly. Bancroft is, above all, uh, a faithful servant of the state. That's how yeah. he sees himself. And he's very conscious of the way in which church and state have to prop each other up in turbulent times. Uh, and he sees his own library as being uh, a really important aspect of that. Um, uh, the metaphor quite often used is that of the arsenal. Mm -hmm. So the library is uh, an arsenal for Bancroft's polemical wars, contra controversial writing and preaching, uh, all of which is both in the service of the church, but also in the service of the state and the crown.